Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Trinity Church Streetsville. My prayer today is that through this service that God would speak to us, that he would speak to us through the reading of scripture, through the sermon, through the songs, and through our intercessory prayers. That he would speak to us, that he would challenge us, that he would inspire us, that he would comfort us, and that he would fill us with his life-giving spirit. Remember that you can connect with us at Trinity uh, through phone calls, through email, Facebook, and our online services. The Lord bless you. Good morning, church. I have a few announcements for you. On Monday, Simon is hosting the monthly prayer meeting from the sanctuary using Zoom. If you don't want to use Zoom, you can pray on your own during that time. Starting Tuesday, we'll be showing the Alpha videos on our Facebook page. Each one is about 30 minutes. Watch as you're able and send us your questions afterwards. The youth are participating in the annual 30-hour famine in support of World Vision. They are fasting from Thursday evening and joining together Friday night and then Saturday morning to break their fast together. Please consider supporting them. Our next trivia night will be on Saturday at 7 p.m. Come a bit early and get your answer sheets ready so we can start right on time. For this or any of the other events, please look in your Thursday email for links. There were 50 cards recently sent out to seniors in our community. And as you know, it's a difficult time right now for people in long-term care. So Elliot's got us organized to write some more cards and letters. So please do feel free to write as you're able and put them in our Trinity mailbox. Thanks so much. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the living room. We're glad that you decided to join us again this week for worship. So let's all lift our voices to the Lord together. Praise his beautiful name.
thank you, Lord, for the strength we find in you. We thank you for the nearness of you. We thank you that when we gather like this, in your name, that you promise you'll be with us. We thank you for all you are and all that we are so grateful for.
reading from Acts chapter 3. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, so did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. The word of the Lord. Hey Trinity, I'm here in Bolt Studios, ready to give a little talk on Peter and John's miracle uh, from the reading that you would have just heard. Now what I want to say about miracles today, about true miracles, is that they fit the pattern laid down in the New Testament. And, you know, they're always going to rile up all sorts of opposition from people who have hard hearts. They're going to be faked by fakers, you know, they're going to be counterfeit miracles out there, sure. But healings and signs are always a part of the church's gift, a gift given to it by Christ. And all we have to do is ask. So jumping into the story, it's like hardly been three months since Peter betrayed Christ. And Jesus is resurrected and he brings Peter back into the fold and he tells him to feed his sheep. Forty days later, he tells the disciples to go into Jerusalem and wait for him because he's going to send the Holy Spirit. He ascends into heaven. They wait for like 50 days, and the Holy Spirit falls on them with power, and Peter is a new man. He's a new man. He and John, they walk up to the temple, and on their way they meet uh, a lame beggar. And just like Jesus used to do, he heals him on the spot. Then, like Jesus... These apostles, they boldly walk into the temple and they lay down the gospel. They're like, you guys killed the Messiah, but he rose from the dead and he has gone into heaven to send us the Holy Spirit. You have this window of time to repent and to receive him. And all this happened just like the prophet said. Now after this, Peter and John, they're taken to the Sanhedrin just like Jesus was in front of the very same people. And instead of caving like Peter did in the past, He boldly tells them the same thing. The very men, Caiaphas and Annas, the high priests. But there's there's nothing they can do to shut these guys down because the miracle is so indisputable. But the funny thing is, they see the evidence and they still tell them to be quiet and they threaten them. It's just like the time, again, that Jesus, he'd done this several times. He healed a man born blind. And the Pharisees, they question him. And they just refuse to take it as a sign of Jesus being who he says he was. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, and they want to kill Lazarus to get the guy off the scene. They just did not want to see. They just didn't want to see. They had other motivations, self-interest, and the miracles only served to harden their hearts. Just like Moses' miracles in the Old Testament only served to harden Pharaoh's heart. Now, last summer, I read the account of this awakening in Motling in Germany during the 1840s. It's this young pastor, Johann Christian Blumhardt. He takes this new parish, and all this crazy stuff starts going down. He, he's not looking for a spiritual fight, but this fight comes to him, and he has to, like, do this exorcism. And after that happens, like, it's like this, this weight is lifted off the town, and people start, like, showing up at his door day after day after day after day, confessing their sins. 
And then after like everybody's done this, miracles start happening day after day after day after day, healings. And what happens after that? I mean, like the rest of Germany starts finding out about it and the authorities are like, hey, cut that out. Why is that? Because the doctors were like running out of work. So again, like self-interested kind of small thinking about what God's doing. So Johann's son, uh, Christoph, I read him too. You know, he just couldn't get over this fact, like the fact that there's always this opposition to these miracles and stuff that he, he grew up seeing. And of course, it's like, it's disappointing the Holy Spirit always has opposition. And yet, it's additionally disappointing for his son Christoph because, you know, he had these, this expectation that the Holy Spirit was supposed to just keep making the world a better and better and better place. But why should we expect that when the Holy Spirit works, he's not going to be opposed by unbelief? You know, that's, a, that's the pattern, again, set by Jesus. And we're never going to do better than him. A servant is not greater than his master, Jesus said. That's the way it's going to be. Some Christians say, well, then forget miracles. You know, they're not, they're not proving anything to anybody. They're not proving anything to skeptics, so forget about them. And, and, you know, the miracle business is full of frauds. There's all sorts of charlatans claiming to do these things. So they kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, I started to take my faith seriously when I was like 17 or 18 years old. Um, I had this camp counselor. He sort of sorted me out. And he was this Mennonite guy at a Mennonite camp. And he started manifesting some charismatic kind of phenomena, you know, just stuff. And like people couldn't explain it. And they were just kind of creeped out by it because like the Mennonites, at least these Mennonites, were cessationists. Like they didn't believe that miracles happened anymore after New Testament times. Now, where does the cessationism idea come from? For all of church history up to the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, when like a bunch of us left the Roman Catholic Church, um, there were tons of miracle stories. It was just like a part of the faith that this stuff keeps happening. And Catholics, they never stopped experiencing miracles. So Protestants, in order to discredit Catholics, a lot of them had to sort of claim that, you know, all their miracles were counterfeit. It's an easy solution to the problem of Christian division. Uh, to just stop discerning miracles altogether. That way you don't have to be challenged by Christians from other other churches. You know in advance that everyone, you know, from that church is just wrong. Case closed. And I think that's just lazy. You don't have, you don't get off the hook from discernment just because you think there are fakers out there. There are definitely fakers out there, but you don't get off the hook from using your discernment. And... Acts, again, tells us that that's the way it's going to be. You know, Peter, again, uh, some chapters later, he's shadowed by this guy named Simon the Magician. And Simon, he's super impressed with all the miracles that Peter's doing. And he, and he even get, gets baptized as a Christian. And then a little while in, he wants Peter to sell him his power. So that's the way it's always going to be. There are still televangelists and people who just perform magic tricks for money, essentially. Doesn't mean miracles don't still happen. It's just the Bible told us that's the way it was going to be. And to be sure, there's always room for doubt. There's always room for doubt, even under the best circumstances. Because the miracles that happen after New Testament times aren't exactly on the same level as New Testament miracles. This is another sort of problem that some more conservative pro Protestants have. You know, miracles still happen, yeah, but biblical miracles are like the paradigms and models and blueprints for all later miracles. And that's what I've been doing is trying to show you as we go along that like the New Testament miracles, they tell us exactly what's going to be happening with true and false miracles and how to discern between them. So 
biblical miracles, because they're paradigms, you know, and Peter's miracle just fits this pattern that, this, that Jesus laid down about miracles. What we're supposed to do then is like, if we're in doubt, we're supposed to hold it up to the pattern given in the Bible. And that's how we discern. So the biblical pattern is that miracles, they're always going to provoke opposition. They're always going to attract uh, fraudsters and counterfeiters. Uh, but the true miracles are always, here's the next point, linked to repentance as well. Peter walks in the temple and he uses this miracle to call people to repentance. Anytime Jesus healed someone, he would forgive their sins. That's because he came to heal both body and soul. And the church considers like both the confession of sins and exorcisms and, and physical healings to all be under the umbrella of healing. Repentance is like a healing of your soul. Repentance sometimes is like the first step towards physical healing. And if we're not seeing many healings, sometimes perhaps it's because we're not seeing much repentance in ourselves. Now, the other reason we might not experience healings is that we don't ask for them. Like at the Mennonite camp, I was told that people with strong faith didn't need miracles. And I was like, that's crazy. That's backwards. You don't ask for healing because you don't have faith. So I went to uh, this church in Vancouver called St. John Shaughnessy. And uh, I was friends with a priest my age who grew up in John Wimber's church. And John Wimber, back in uh, 1980, that's the beginning of this like uh, vineyard movement, which is this huge explosion of sort of like miraculous gifts and stuff like that. And Jim talked about seeing all of this stuff, all these healings when he was a kid. And, you know, it's like the youth group up there at the front praying for people every week. And things are just like happening because the youth group uh, is praying for people. The remarkable thing about Wimber, the thing that I like about Wimber is he just had like, he just had a theology of healing and he was just like, we're just going to pray for healing every week for a really long time. And whether it happens or not, that's not up to us. And so they just prayed for healing for a really long time and it eventually started to happen. But it was just that like endurance and that asking that lay behind it, that was foundational. And this is what Peter does. He leaves the Sanhedrin. He goes back to the church. Together, they pray that God would give them great boldness in the face of all of these threats from the Sanhedrin, that God would continue to show his power. They say, now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So we need to eagerly desire the greater gifts and ask God for this gift. He knows that we need it. He knows that we need it at this time. So the last thing I want to say is that like, while some people have a remarkable gift of healing, like Peter, it's also just an ordinance of the church. The book of James says, Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. So while we might not be anointing people with oil during uh, the pandemic, it's important to know that Trinity's pastors are available to pray for your healing. So if you need that, take advantage of it. Just let me pray. Jesus, we thank you that you ascended into heaven so that we could receive the Holy Spirit poured out on us and that you've given us as the church all the gifts we need, all the things we need. And we pray that you would um, give us the gift of healing, healing of souls and bodies, that you would teach us to forgive and you'd, you'd forgive us and that you'd heal us. We pray all these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
friends, let's pray. Lord, we gather together this morning physically apart, but one in heart and spirit as your church. And we are truly grateful for the profound privilege of doing that. Lord, this has been a truly hard week in a series of hard weeks. Lord, this morning, we lift to you the people of Nova Scotia, the lives lost due to the incomprehensible violence. Fathers, mothers, sisters, brothers, sons and daughters, colleagues and dear friends, gone. And we struggle, Lord, to make sense of the senseless. Lord, we know that you bind up the brokenhearted and we just pray that your presence would be so dearly felt in the midst of this deep sorrow. Lord, we hold before you those who live in long-term care residence, our precious elders, who are fearfully watching their neighbors and friends die in disproportionate numbers in this pandemic. We pray too for their families who cannot be with their loved ones and the hopelessness and the helplessness and the the deep sadness that is inherent in these realities. Lord, we pray for the caregivers, those in long-term facilities and in our hospitals, nurses, doctors, PSWs, techs, all those who put themselves out on the front lines in the care of their communities, in the care of us, at the risk of their own health. Lord, we give you thanks for them and we pray your protection over them. Likewise, those who find themselves deemed essential, they didn't sign up for this, but they continue to show up and look after their communities and we give you thanks for them and we pray your protection over them as well. We pray your peace over the places where people shelter. May they be safe spaces, Lord. May spirits of anger and frustration be, be held down and may our families not be overwhelmed by the need to try and balance family life and school life and work life all under one roof in a time where they're spending far more time together than than normal lord we pray that there would be moments of pure joy that the sense of being bonded together deeply as family would rise up and that is what would be remembered for those who shelter alone lord we pray that your presence would fill the lonely places. And for those place, people in our, in our country and in, around the world who have no home to shelter in, Lord, we pray for these most vulnerable and we pray for those who minister to them. Both your protection and your blessing be upon them all, Lord. Lord, in this present darkness, we pray that we would be incredibly sensitive to your light, the light that cannot be extinguished. We pray that we would see your hand at work and respond to the call that you place on each of us in the places that you call us to be and to not be. And in this coming week, Lord, we pray that we would lay down at your cross our hopes, our fears, our dreams, our anxieties, and be filled instead with your peace and your sense of purpose that we might be salt and light wherever we happen to be at this present time. And we pray all of this, Lord, through the powerful, precious, and life-giving name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, so. 
so kind to me. And all the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the dying and I couldn't earn. I don't Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You had been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid. So, so No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me.
Thank you for joining us today at Trinity Church. Please check out our website, which has information to subscribe to our YouTube channel, to online giving and to the services that we're offering to you at this challenging time. Remember this, that God is good and his love endures forever. Amen.